Monsieur le Président de la Fondation, Mesdames et Messieurs Vlatsi, chers lauréats, Ladies and Gentlemen, je regrette que ce n'est pas possible pour moi de parler en français ce soir. C'est possible, mais c'est trop difficile. Je parle votre merveilleuse langue, malheureusement, comme un élève à l'école en Écosse, il y a 30 ans. Et ce que je veux dire ce soir, ce n'est pas facile. Les relations entre la finance et la politique sont extrêmement compliquées. Je crois que sans l'histoire, nous ne pouvons pas comprendre ces relations. Bon, ça suffit. I would like to tell you a story. And it must be said that compared with the academic work that has been honored tonight, my story is in fact not very complicated at all, at least not in English. I want to try to explore the connection between financial crisis and political populism. And if you are wondering why my first slide this evening depicts the Mad Hatter's Tea Party from Alice in Wonderland, then stay tuned. In the wake of what has been the biggest financial crisis uh, since the Depression, we have lived through and continue to witness a succession of backlashes. Let me begin with the backlash against finance itself. This curious object is a model of a giant vampire squid. Those of you who are regular readers of that august journal Rolling Stone will be aware that last year one of its writers, uh, Matt Taibbi, described the investment bank Goldman Sachs. Yes, you'll be relieved to hear that it was Goldman Sachs and not UBS. <laughs> as, I quote, a great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Disappointingly, Rolling Stone did not illustrate the piece with a giant vampire squid, for which I must say I have a very low opinion of the editor. However, in an anti-Goldman Sachs protest that was staged in New York shortly after the publication of the piece, uh, some of the protesters had the wit to make this giant vampire squid which, as you can see, is playing uh, with uh, a small planet, planet Earth, in its tentacles. Incidentally, those of us who study the history of uh, finance recognize this image only too well. More than a hundred years ago, populist critics of the financial system, about whom I will say more presently, depicted the House of Rothschild as a giant octopus, once again playing with the world as if it were a mere ball. So part one of the backlash that follows any financial crisis is a backlash against finance itself. But that's not all. We are also witnessing a backlash against political incumbents, against those politicians unfortunate enough to be in office when the financial storm broke. I'm sure you are all avid readers of that other august journal, The Sun newspaper. And if you are, you'll remember well the decisive moment in the recent election uh, in my own country, the United Kingdom. This occurred when the Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, uh, had the bad luck to leave a microphone on after an encounter with a member of the public. 
Now, you all know, ladies and gentlemen, that after an encounter with a member of the public, you should take the microphone off <laughs> before you say words to the effect that she was, quote, just a bigoted woman. She was described that way by Mr. Brown because Gillian Duffy had had the temerity to raise the issue of East European immigration to the United Kingdom, an issue which the Prime Minister was very resolved not to talk about during the election campaign. Those words, just a bigoted woman, almost certainly ensured Mr. Brown's election defeat and departure from office. And soon he will be able to uh, form a club with other leaders swept from power by the financial crisis as well as their own ill-judged words. The former Prime Minister of the Netherlands, for example, Mr. Balkenende, could buy him a drink and they could discuss why it was that the financial crisis had to happen on their watch. Mr. Brown must wonder as he sees his former partner, Mr. Tony Blair's memoirs soar up the bestseller list. Why it couldn't have happened to Tony? <laughs> there are those political incumbents who seek to dodge the flying bullet of financial crisis by directing the bullet away from themselves towards others. It is, I think, no coincidence that the French president, Monsieur Sarkozy, chose this past year to raise the issue uh, of the full female veil, the burqa, uh, and turn it into a major political objective of his government to prohibit that article of clothing. Uh, only a few days ago, this passed into French law. It is now illegal to wear a burqa in France. I, ladies and gentlemen, do not propose to enter into the rights and wrongs of that question. Merely to point out that it is a not uncommon historical strategy when faced with a major financial crisis to bash people who are uh, originally of immigrant stock and to direct fire at their culture. Nor does the backlash end there. Yesterday, as I'm sure you will have seen on your television news, there were demonstrations in numerous European countries, mainly organized by trade union movements, against so-called austerity budgets. Uh, this picture is uh, of a demonstration uh, in Valencia in Spain. I could show you many more. And believe me, you will see many and probably bigger demonstrations uh, in the months ahead as the austerity measures introduced by governments like the Spanish government take their toll, particularly take their toll on public sector trade unions and their rather comfortable pension packages. So, we are already in the midst of a political backlash following a great financial crisis. And what I want to do this evening is to try to explain the nature of the connection by using historical context, by showing you that we have in some ways seen this movie before. Let's just get this crisis into perspective, shall we? It's been described uh, in a recent New York Times column uh, by Paul Krugman as a third Great Depression, which rather confused some people who'd only ever heard of one before. It's good that he did that, in fact, because I want you to learn a bit more this evening about the original Great Depression that began in 1873. But before we get to that, let me just clarify why this is not as bad as the Great Depression of 1929 to 32. Right now, the biggest economy in the world is said to be out of recession, in the sense that the National Bureau of Economic Research pronounced the end of the recession to have come in June of last year, uh, a pronouncement that elicited incredulity from the many Americans who have lost their homes, their jobs, or their savings, and see very little sign of recovery 
in the United States today. Accepting, however, this official definition, which says that the recession is over when the downturn stops and the economy begins to recover, it has been, without question, the longest recession since World War II, uh, measuring fully 18 months, which is longer than the recessions of the early 70s and early 1980s. But, as you can see from this slide, uh, it's still a lot shorter than the Great Depression of 1929 to 32, 33, which lasted fully 43 months, and shorter still than the original Great Depression uh, of 1873 to 79, which lasted, according to the NBER definition, 65 months. So it's a long or great recession, or if you prefer, and I do prefer, a slight depression. Real gross domestic product growth has been negative for five out of the last ten quarters. The recovery is clearly slackening in the United States right now, and the reason that Americans do not feel any real sense of recovery is that long-term unemployment has reached a record high in post-war terms, though not anything like what was seen during the Depression. So here we can see, if we look at quarterly numbers uh, for the change uh, in gross domestic product adjusted for inflation, that this was a longer, though not actually especially deep, recession than any thing since the war. We can also see that the long-term unemployed rate is really very strikingly high indeed. What this chart does is it shows you the percentage of the unemployed who have been out of work in America for 27 weeks or more, and it's now 45% and still rising. And that is why the perception in the American public that this is more like a depression than a recession and that it's not over is so deeply rooted. However, I want to emphasize that if it's a slight depression, that does mean something different from a Great Depression. If it was a Great Depression, ladies and gentlemen, your investments in developed market stock markets, and I'm sure you all collectively have vast sums invested in stock markets, since this is, after all, Switzerland, your investments would be down 85% rather than just 30%. Because at this stage in the Great Depression, this many months in, that was where the US stock market was, 85% below its peak. If, and I'm sure some of you were wise enough to do this, if you'd invested in emerging markets, and particularly in Latin American markets, you wouldn't be complaining at all. Because actually you would have seen a real annual return of something like six and three quarter percent throughout this crisis. Colombia was the best buy, uh, and you can ponder why that might be, and perhaps you can tell me the answer. If you were properly diversified as an investor and had a significant portfolio of bonds, government or corporate, you actually 20% or so up. So this was not anything like as big an economic shock as the Great Depression that began in 1929. Let me show you some charts. I hope they're visible. Uh, to those at the back, which explain the difference between the Great Depression of 1929 to 33 and our time. These charts are the work of my old friends Barry Eichengreen and Kevin O'Rourke, who uh, did the great service of regularly updating their comparisons uh, in an article that they published online. What this chart shows you is that global industrial output did fall at a depression-like rate up until the summer of 2009. Essentially, if you followed the red line, which is our crisis, and compare it with the blue line, which is the crisis that began in 1929, they match perfectly for a very significant period. And then they diverge. And they diverged, just as the NBER says uh, for the US economy, in around June of 2009. Same story when you look at world trade. In fact, world trade fell more sharply in our crisis than in the fa beginning phase of the Depression. But then, unlike in the Depression, trade recovered. And the recovery was, once again, from mid-2009 onwards. If you look at global stock markets, you see just how steep the crisis was 
how severe the losses were in 2008-2009, but then you see the bounce. You can see that as uh, in every other indicator I've shown you so far, the initial depression trend ended in mid-2009. And if you take the US stock market, it's very clear. Something happened in the summer of 2009 to pull the US economy out of a tailspin, which, had it continued, would have replicated the Great Depression. And this is a very important thing to understand. I want you to see that we came very close indeed to a rerun of the Great Depression, but avoided it. And part of what I want to do this evening is to reflect on why that was and then to proceed to discuss the political consequences. There are, I think, three reasons why we are not in a Great Depression, why we are only in a slight depression or a Great Recession. And the first is, in fact, China. Unlike in the early 1930s, one important economy continued to grow at an impressively rapid rate despite uh, the near collapse of the Western financial system. And that economy uh, was China's. Now the second largest in the world, overtaking Japan this year. And what is impressive about this chart is that you can see that nothing remotely approaching a recession happened in China in this crisis and that the International Monetary Fund expects China's growth to remain remarkably close to 10% per annum going forward to 2015. So one reason we're not in a Great Depression was that a new engine of growth kicked in. And that engine was China. Other Asian economies also grew. India's performed impressively. But most of the other Asian economies grew because China grew. And China's stimulus was really the crucial reason why global trade recovered in the second half of 2009 and continues to recover reasonably today. The second reason we're not in a Great Depression is that one person at least learnt from history. And that person was Ben Bernanke. The chairman of the Federal Reserve, fortunately, uh, was a financial historian when the chips were down. This really was very lucky indeed. The number of people in the United States who have studied uh, the finances and particularly the banking aspects of the Great Depression is really very small. I routinely ask American audiences who and these are audiences of financial experts, who has read Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's Monetary History of the United States, the single most important work of financial history written about the United States? Generally, in a room this size, I get three hands at most. Because financial history, ladies and gentlemen, is not studied the way, for example, quantitative methods in finance are studied. Luckily, as I say, the man who was running US monetary policy had read Friedman and Schwartz and indeed had read a few books on the subject besides and had contributed his own scholarly papers on the banking crisis of the early 1930s. So we know that at least one person in control knew what to do. And what he did was very simple. He did the exact opposite of what the Fed did in the Depression. The exact opposite. In fact, Ben Bernanke fulfilled a pledge that he made to Milton Friedman shortly before Friedman's death when he said, we promise you we've learned and we won't let it happen again. We won't do it again. We won't allow the economy to contract by failing to expand the monetary base in the face of a banking crisis. What you see here is the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve System, which is another uh, way of describing the monetary base of the US economy. Ben Bernanke multiplied the size of that monetary base by a factor of 2.6, mostly in the aftermath of the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the second reason why we are not in a Great Depression. Had he not done that, many more financial institutions would have failed than did fail after Lehman went bust. The third reason 
It is commonly argued, though I'm not sure I entirely believe this, that we are not in a Great Depression has to do with fiscal policy and the very large deficits that have been run uh, by the United States and by other governments. These should not be described simply as fiscal stimulus because most of the deficits in the US and elsewhere in fact arose because of collapsing tax revenues and rising welfare payments, what economists call automatic stabilizers. Nobody had to make a decision, it just happened because that's the way the fiscal system works in a developed economy. But part of it in the United States, $787 billion or so, was undoubtedly due to a discretionary fiscal stimulus. And believe me, economic historians will argue for years about whether that stimulus had any significant effect. Let's just say it probably did no harm, it may even have done some good, and it certainly helped Bernanke's monetary policy by providing additional sources that he could uh, turn into liquidity, additional government bonds. There has, of course, been a debate in this country, as there has been a debate in my country, about the wisdom of fiscal stimulus. One of the nice things about this chart is it allows you to compare fiscal stimuli the world over. What's striking is that when you look at fiscal stimulus in relation to gross domestic product and rank the uh, stimuli, the United States has been, without question, the biggest of the Keynesians. I've circled uh, Switzerland because, as you can see, there was almost no Keynesian fiscal response in this country by American standards. The deficit uh, was really very small indeed internationally. Uh, Korea, Australia, one can go down the list, uh, all were not far behind the United States in the scale of their borrowing. Now, I leave aside the question of whether these great fiscal injections were as important as Keynesian economists like Paul Krugman and Martin Wolf claim. That is not my subject for tonight. My subject for tonight is what happens next. Since not every country has been as restrained as Switzerland, since most developed countries have pursued Keynesian policies or have at least allowed their deficits to balloon willy-nilly, we face a situation in which the world has turned upside down. It used to be emerging markets that had debt crises that ended up with really large debts in relation to gross domestic product. Now in the wake of the crisis, it is the developed economies that have a debt crisis. As you can see, if you look at the advanced economies in the G20, we are heading for a situation uh, within just the next few years in which, on average, they will have a debt-to-GDP ratio significantly above 100% and, in fact, closer to 120%. The trouble is, as we are now seeing, if you go on a debt binge, it's a bit like going on an alcohol binge. You get a hangover. And the interesting thing is to find out who got the hangover first. This chart shows you the latest uh, trends in bond yields, 10-year bond yields, uh, for Greece, uh, for Ireland, for Portugal, and for Spain. Uh, Greece uh, is up top. It's seen uh, a massive uh, increase in bond yields since this crisis of uh, European sovereign debt began. Ireland and Portugal are in second place and third place, and Spain is doing relatively well still. The point is that governments that borrow consistently in the range of 10% of gross domestic product, sooner or later, suffer a loss of credibility. And when they suffer that loss of credibility, in the eyes of bond investors, a terrible a tailspin begins. As the markets lose faith, they sell the bonds. As the bonds fall in price, so the interest rate, the yield for new borrowing, goes up. As that goes up, the cost of financing new borrowing goes up. And so the deficit becomes larger. And the larger the deficit becomes, the less confidence there is in the market. And so on, down and down and down. The Greek tragedy, now the Irish tragedy, Pretty soon the Portuguese tragedy, we must hope 
but it is only hope that it doesn't soon become a Spanish tragedy. That is the process that is underway and it has begun in peripheral Europe, in southern Europe and Ireland, but I do not believe that it will stop there. And the fact that it won't stop there is really tremendously important for the argument I want to make this evening. You will frequently hear the bailout that happened earlier this year as a Greek bailout. This is a complete misnomer because what in fact happened was that funds were made available to Greece and also uh, to Ireland and Portugal and Spain to prevent a major crisis in North European banking. What this table shows you is the exposure of the German, French, Belgian and Dutch banks to the so-called PIGS. Now PIGS is an ugly acronym uh, for Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece and Spain but you'll see why I don't mind using it in just a little minute. The point, and I want to emphasize this because we're not so very far away from Germany, the point is that when one hears German economists and politicians lecturing South Europeans for their wickedness and their profligacy, we are hearing what can only be described as hypocrisy because the bailout was a bailout of German banks more than it was a bailout of the Greek government. Let's revert to the pigs. Let me show you why the markets lost confidence in those pigs. I want you to look here at the four charts. One for Portugal, one for Ireland, one for uh, Greece, and one for Spain. These charts come from a study published earlier this year by your own Bank for International Settlements, a wonderful institution that produces some of the best analysis uh, of the financial world that there is. And indeed, it was one of the few institutions to anticipate the financial crisis before it happened. It's just too bad the BEIS has no power. What they showed in their study was that these four countries were an co odd course for fiscal crisis. If they did not correct their policies at all, their debt to GDP ratios would rise to either 300% or in the case of Greece, 400% by 2040. Even if they corrected policy in one of two ways, and I won't bore you with the details, even with significant policy correction, they all still ended up above 100% of GDP. And since those policy corrections seemed rather a remote prospect earlier this year, it's not surprising that people concluded they really were pigs. It's just that when you look at the same study a little more closely and look at the charts for the United Kingdom and the United States, it turns out that they're not the only pigs out there. Prior to the election of the new government and the uh, stern budget introduced by my friend George Osborne, Britain was on course to be a record breaker heading for a debt-GDP ratio of 500% without policy correction. And not far behind was the United States, which, nota bene, has not introduced any kind of fiscal retrenchment measure since this study. In other words, nothing alters the picture presented here that the United States is on course to have a debt-GDP ratio in excess of 400% by 2040. This inspired a headline which I was not allowed to use in the Financial Times, thanks to the extreme meanness of the editor, Lionel Barber. But I want to share it with you. <laughs> I want to share it with you because this sums up, in essence, uh, the situation that the problems of the so-called pigs are in fact somewhat less in a long-term perspective than the problems of the United States. Let me show you once again from a slightly different source why that is so. Imagine a calculation which leaves out gross domestic product but only looks at tax revenues and calculate the relationship between debt and tax revenues expressed as a percentage the figure for Greece is indeed a shocking 312%. And that is notably worse than any other European country. But if you go down the right-hand column, you will find 
that the United States is even worse, with a ratio of 3.6, 358%. That is why the slogan, pigs are us, is no facile joke, ladies and gentlemen. The United States, without a significant change in its fiscal policy, is on course for a major fiscal crisis. The only reason that this crisis has not already begun is that the United States, as a superpower that issues the world's number one reserve currency, has a cushion. It has some room for maneuver that Greece and Ireland and Portugal don't have. The Congressional Budget Office produces its own projections and they show very clearly the scale of the problem. The CBO, which I think uses more optimistic assumptions than the Bank for International Settlements, still says that its more likely scenario propels the debt-GDP ratio up towards uh, 180% by 2035. That is their more likely scenario. They have a less likely baseline scenario which assumes that nothing will change. The alternative scenario, the higher one, assumes that American politicians will act the way they usually act, which is why it's the more likely scenario. Having set the scene economically, let me now turn to the political implications. And for those of you who dislike economics, it is time to breathe a sigh of relief. I want to focus on two are dimensions, the international and the domestic. And I want to begin with the international, and I want to begin in particular with the fear on the part of America's creditors of inflation. About half of the federal debt in public hands is held by foreigners. And of that, a very large proportion indeed is held by the Chinese monetary authorities. The Chinese, for over a year, have been fretting that US policy is on course for a dollar devaluation, and they understandably fear that they will be the ones who pick up the tab, since they hold around $2 trillion of dollar-denominated reserves at the present time. The US government has strong incentives to reduce its real burden of debt through inflation and dollar devaluation. According this is to uh, Zhang Ming, Deputy Chief of the International Finance Research Office at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Whichever way it is, the yuan recorded market value of treasuries will fall, causing huge capital losses to China's central bank. That is what the Chinese fear. And I could supply you with 10 other quotations to the same effect, all from this year. Now, you can understand why the Chinese feel this way. As the biggest importer of commodities in the world, they're acutely aware that commodity price inflation has taken off since the global economy came out of its tailspin. You can see here that the principal commodity indices all ticked up uh, from the middle of 2009. And with gold, and I'm sure you're all great hoarders of gold, with gold now above $1,300 an ounce, most people would see that as a strong signal of future inflation. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, without really anybody noticing, the Chinese have significantly reduced their holdings of US Treasuries uh, since the summer of last year, down by around 10%, uh, I calculate. Uh, so they now hold only 10%, rather than previously 13% of the entire federal debt in public hands. So that is one, that is one view of the world. And it is one reason why what I have described as Chimerica, the fusion of at least economic interest between the United States and China, is unraveling before our very eyes. But I want to suggest to you, and it's an extremely important point, so if you're feeling remotely sleepy, this is the moment to suddenly jolt awake. I want to suggest to you that the Chinese fears may be misplaced and that at least for the foreseeable future, deflation is a more likely scenario in the United States. Why do I think this? One, because the, the maturity, the term structure of the US federal debt is relatively short uh, and because bond investors are highly vigilant 
to the extent of being vigilantes, any sign of an increase in future inflation is likely to be responded to with a rise in nominal yields, in nominal interest rates. If that happens before inflation happens, we may actually see a rise in real interest rates. And that is a much more serious concern for such a highly leveraged economy with both huge public debt and even huger private debt, mostly on household balance sheets. What I want to suggest to you, the point I want to make to you tonight, is that under those circumstances, the distributional conflicts will be more painful politically than would be the case if there were inflation. In fact, secretly, subconsciously, Americans want and need inflation. It's just that they can't admit it, and in any case, they're not going to get it. Here are the latest US inflation numbers for core consumer price inflation. You can see it's heading for zero. And if you look at other indicators, producer price index uh, or the uh, Philadelphia Fed's uh, prices received index, it's actually already in negative territory, which is really quite a sobering thought. Even more startling to me is that measures of broad money in the United States, including the now unofficial M3 statistic, uh, is contracting quite sharply at an annualized rate of minus 5%, which is in no way a an inflationary scenario. That is a deflation signal, if ever I saw one. If, if you take all the projections, all the forecasts by all the banks, which I've done, and you look at what they say about 10-year yields and inflation in 2011, you cannot get a negative number. There is absolute 100% agreement that real rates will stay positive into next year. And let me reiterate, positive real interest rates, nominal rates minus inflation, still in positive territory, is extremely bad news for an economy which has an aggregate debt burden of public and private debt of the order of 375% of gross domestic product. We're in a two-speed world. In one world, China's world, inflation is an issue. China's growing at full tilt. They're growing because they massively expanded their credit system. Commodities are spiking because the Chinese are buying them in vast quantities. India has to worry, it always has to worry about the price of food. In the emerging Asian world, inflation is a concern. But in the other world, the world we live in, the developed world, the issue is deflation. And ladies and gentlemen, the night nightmare scenario is very real. That Japan already showed us the future. And that both in the United States and in the European Union, the next few years may be characterized by a Japanese-style combination of exploding public debt, very low nominal rates, positive real rates, and pathetically slow growth. Now comes the history. This has happened before. A period of prolonged deflation and subprime growth happened after the first great financial crisis of 1873, the first great depression that began in that year. Economic performance in the most mature economy in the world, Britain, was feeble in the 1870s and 1880s. The US, which was more an emerging market in those days, had one year of negative growth and then a period of prolonged but slower growth and falling prices. Falling prices, positive real rates, that's the key concept. Because under those circumstances, the conflicts between creditors and debtors become intense and they dominate the domestic political scene. Here's the US Consumer Price Index from 1872 through to 1901. And you can see that prices fell quite steeply by more than 20% peak to trough. And the deflationary trend continued right down to the beginning of the 20th century. Now let me show you a slide I've already shown you with a third line added. Remember I pointed out how different the stock market's performance was in this crisis and in the crisis of 1929? Now look at the blue line. 
That's how the US stock market performed after the peak of May uh, 1872. And I think, if you see the green line moving in that direction, almost towards uh, a meeting, I think we may find ourselves in that kind of a depression. Not a 1929 kind of depression, an 1873 kind of depression. It lasts a long time, but it isn't so severe. And it's characterized not by a collapse in asset prices, but by a slow downward slide, accompanied by a downward slide in prices. We can learn from that period, ladies and gentlemen, a little bit about what lies ahead because that period was associated with the rise of a movement generally known to historians as the populist movement. Populism, ladies and gentlemen, is the politics of the losers and the aspirants, the debtors and those whose earnings are stagnating when they thought they were going to grow. And populism has certain characteristic features familiar to those who've studied the late 19th century. Hostility to bankers, to political incumbents, to foreigners. And one consequence of populism is very often international conflict. Because governments that come under pressure from populists are more likely to raise tariffs, to adopt isolationist foreign policies, to engage in currency wars, competitive devaluations, and to get into arguments about debt default. We have, as I said, seen this movie before. The People's Party never produced a president, but it did produce 10 state governors, 6 senators, 39 representatives, and although it lost one argument, which was the argument to re-monetize silver and go off the gold standard onto a bimetallic standard, the populists successfully pushed the Republicans to raise tariffs and to bust trusts, to bust cartels, and they secured ultimate victory on one of their key issues, prohibition, in 1920, with the uh, prohibition of alcoholic drinks in the United States. This man became the personification of the populist movement. Three-time presidential loser, William Jennings Bryan. Anti-gold, anti-alcohol, anti-empire, and famously anti-Darwin, he was one of the most important and, I believe, disruptive figures in the politics of the late 19th and early 20th century United States. Part of what I want you to imagine this evening is the advent of someone like him. Someone like Brian. If you look at the electoral statistics of the United States, it's very interesting how many votes were cast for candidates that were not from the two major parties. If you just look at the votes for president, uh, it went up from just 1% in 1876, uh, close to 5%, then by 1892 to 12%. If you look at votes uh, for the House, 10% in 1896, above 20% in 1912, and indeed in uh, the presidential election of 1912, non-Democrat, non-Republican uh, candidates together polled 35% of the popular vote. You think the two-party system's kind of God-given in the United States? Uh-uh-uh. In fact, in a time of populist backlash, the two-party system is the thing most likely to come under pressure because that hostility to incumbents applies to both parties. Throw the rascals out is a slogan that applies to Republicans and Democrats alike. What's going to happen in November? Here's what I, I'm told by those who know more about it than I do. Likely gains in the Senate for the Republicans, eight or nine seats. Gains in the House, probably 40, maybe 50. They will get a majority in the House, that's for sure. They could also gain six governorships and end up with the majority of governorships. Most commentators, if you read the press, expect that Obama will react to this by tacking to the center the way Bill Clinton did after Newt Gingrich burst onto the scene in the midterm elections of 1994. I think that's wrong. The last point I want to make you, to you this evening 
is that populism changes the political game as surely as a financial crisis changes the economic game. Let me say a few words about the Tea Party and then open this to discussion. Over half the US electorate today say they favor the Tea Party movement. 35% say they positively support it, and up to a quarter say they are, in fact, members of it. A quarter. 71% of all Republicans say they support the Tea Party. What is the Tea Party? Well, the Tea Party is an allusion to the Boston Tea Party. And its defining characteristic is a kind of constitutional early republic fundamentalism combined with strong fiscal hawkishness, anti-deficit, anti-Keynesian policy, and just a little tiny hint of xenophobia. That's the Tea Party defined in what I would say was the most positive way. <laughs> there are two kinds of Tea Party in this world, ladies and gentlemen. There's the Boston Tea Party, and there's the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. Let me introduce the man who might just be the William Jennings Bryan of our age. His name is Glenn Beck. He's a television host with the fastest growing audience in America. If you've never seen Glenn Beck, you need to go to YouTube tonight and watch some. He's a former alcoholic. He's a convert to Mormonism. He's a pathological hater of Woodrow Wilson. Notice, Woodrow Wilson, the progressive who put the Democrats back in power in 1912 by breaking with the populist tradition. He's a populist. That's what Glenn Beck is. And here's Glenn Beck in an interview he gave to the New York Times that will be published in Sunday's New York Times magazine. Everything that is getting pushed through Congress including this health care bill, is driven by President Obama's thinking on reparations and his desire to settle old racial scores, his deep-seated hatred for white people. Now, that's not the Boston Tea Party, as I understand it. That, I think, is another kind of tea party. Ladies and gentlemen, could populism make a comeback? Yes. It's making it now. The collapse of Barack Obama's popularity uh, since his election two years ago, the realization that he was not, in fact, the Messiah, that he was just another Chicago politician, with all that that implies, has opened the gate for a major shift in American politics, comparable in its nature and scale to the populist backlash of the late 19th century, of the first Great Depression. It's interesting that President Obama's only response seems to be to shift to protectionism. He seems to have read the script, and he knows that's what you do as an incumbent in the United States. So watch out. The China bashing season is upon us. President Obama spoke forthrightly on this subject just last week, and the Congress today has passed legislation essentially authorizing the imposition of punitive tariffs if the Chinese do not change their currency policy. I'm telling you, we have seen this movie before. So, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> do get ready for 2012. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, we started rather late, uh, and so we're running rather late, and I therefore don't blame you if you're running for the exits. You may also want to be selling your US treasuries at this point. Uh, if you would like to ask a question or two um, before the reception, I'm very happy to take questions. You can ask them in French or in English. But slowly in French. Do you have any 
Yes. So, would you have any idea of the future of the euro? <laughs> the uh, short answer to that question, and it better be short, is, uh, and short in both senses of the word, is that the euro can only have a future as a relatively weak currency. And that seems to me to be the likely, the likely scenario. Remember, the, uh, the pass was sold by M. Trichet when he agreed to participate uh, in the so-called Greek bailout and to do what he previously resisted doing, namely to monetize uh, sovereign debt from member states. The euro can't disintegrate because the costs of doing so, of breaking it up, I think would outweigh the benefits for both the strong and the weak countries. So I think it will continue to exist. The problem for Switzerland is that it will exist as a relatively weak currency because it's only through money printing uh, that the European Central Bank can help avoid a massive sovereign default crisis in the next 12 months. Thanks very much. You, <coughs> you made Our microphone has died. Uh, ah, it's, okay. it's awake. Uh, you made a very black picture about the, our future, especially because the very big in-depthness of all uh, the countries. <coughs> but we should resolve this problem, and maybe it's a solution to, for this. For sure, the real economy is not able to higher taxes, but the financial sectors, the financial markets, are full of money. We should tax the financial market in order to solve this problem. Not only because they are, because they thought we have the crisis, but because uh, it is a very big disequilibrium, macroeconomic disequilibrium. It's too much money for investment, not enough for consumption. So the financial, the taxes on the financial transa transactions would be a solution. I ask you, what do you think about this? Well, thanks for that question. I have been following with some interest the debate on uh, the taxing of banks in both Europe and the United States or the taxing of transactions. Of course, some financial transactions are already taxed. I know this because I just sold a house in Boston today and I'm reeling from the amount of tax that has been extracted from what I thought was a modest profit. Uh, the problem, it seems to me, with uh, a Tobin tax, a tax on financial uh, transactions or turnover, uh, is that unless it's introduced internationally in a coordinated way, uh, then whoever introduces it will lose their financial sector to whoever doesn't introduce it. And getting coordination on financial taxation will probably be about as hard as getting coordination on the reduction of CO2 emissions. So that it seems to me to be the big problem. The mobility of finance is so great that unless it's a global solution, uh, then it's not going to happen at all. By the way, I don't accept that the fiscal problems of the major developed countries require massive new taxation of capital to be solved. It seems to me that successful fiscal reform in, say, the United States could actually involve a simplification of the income tax code, a reduction of corporate tax, but an increase in a tax on consumption, uh, either through a value-added tax or preferably a sales tax. Why do I say that? Because it has been excessive consumption and inadequate saving more, it seems to me, than anything else that has propelled the Western economies over the cliff edge. And a restructuring of the fiscal systems of the Western world, both on the expenditure side and on the revenue side, is what is most urgently needed. Unfortunately, and this will be my concluding reflection, the number of politicians in Washington, D.C., willing to talk seriously and honestly about fiscal reform to address the problem of both entitlements, Social Security and Medicare, and taxation, is so small that I can count it on the fingers of one hand. Populism, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, is much easier and, in fact, more politically effective than telling the truth to voters. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. I'll sit down now.
On your behalf, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank Professor Ferguson for this uh, very inspiring uh, talk. I, inspiring, I say this with some kind of hesitation. I must admit that when a historian paints a bleak perspective, I, I'm a little concerned that uh, this will be the history of the future. However, I would nevertheless would like to thank you. I think you've opened uh, our eyes and uh, whether we can help uh, the future perhaps a little, we'll see. Thank you very much. Mesdames et Messieurs, vous êtes invités à une réception qui se tient uh, à la sortie du, uh, de cet auditoire. Je vous remercie d'être venu ici et au nom de la Fondation LATSIS et de l'Université de Genève, je vous souhaite une excellente soirée.